Hello everybody. Muy buenas tardes a todas y a todos. Es un gusto estar en este bellísimo lugar, un paraíso sin duda. Con la representación del Pleno del Instituto Nacional de Transparencia, Acceso a la Información Pública y Protección de Datos Personales de México, que ostenta la presidencia de la Asamblea Global de la Privacidad, me complace en esta tarde darles la más cordial bienvenida a las autoridades, especialistas y profesionales que se han trasladado a esta joya caribeña que es Bermuda para sumarse a las actividades en este espacio de diálogo y cooperación, el más importante en materia de privacidad y protección de datos personales a nivel internacional en su 45 quinta edición. Quiero expresarle nuestro profundo agradecimiento y saludar a las distinguidas personalidades en este acto protocolario de apertura, particularmente su excelencia, la gobernadora de Bermuda, señora Rina Lalji. Muchas gracias por recibirnos. Y a nuestro muy querido anfitrión, el comisionado de privacidad de Bermuda, Alexander White. Quiero de manera especial resaltar la presencia de la comisionada Josefina Román, que desde el Instituto Nacional de Transparencia, Acceso a la Información y Protección de Datos Personales, aquí presente ella, ha coordinado este gran esfuerzo para que podamos no solamente llevar a cabo distintos trabajos en la agenda de la privacidad desde esta Asamblea. Muchas gracias, Comisionada Román. Saludamos con la representación del INAI, por supuesto, y desde la presidencia de la Asamblea Global de la Privacidad, a las eminentes autoridades representantes de distintos países, a las y los distinguidos miembros de la sociedad civil, académicos y profesionales que nos honran con su presencia en esta tarde, tanto de manera virtual como presencial. Considero importante reconocer el esmero y la hospitalidad brindados por nuestros anfitriones a las autoridades de Bermudas, entre ellas la Autoridad de Protección de Datos Personales, a quien reconocemos por su liderazgo y proactividad para llevar a buen puerto la organización de este espacio. Les expresamos nuestra profunda felicitación y gratitud por el excepcional trabajo que están desplegando en esta Asamblea, de igual manera, destaco el invaluable aporte del Comité Consultivo del Programa, cuyo esfuerzo conjunto ha permitido la definición de las actividades, temas y oradores que enriquecerán nuestros conocimientos en los próximos días. Es importante resaltar el papel esencial desempeñado por el Comité Ejecutivo en la planificación de esta jornada. La realización de esta asamblea es sin duda un logro colectivo y un testimonio elocuente de colaboración y dedicación. Durante más de cuatro décadas, la Asamblea Global de la Privacidad ha desempeñado un papel vital al impulsar esfuerzos para que las autoridades encargadas de tutelar este derecho humano cumplan con su mandato de manera eficaz al tiempo que puedan garantizar elevados estándares de seguridad y protección, promoviendo la colaboración regulatoria abierta y propositiva. Hoy nos encontramos en una época de cambios y de transformaciones acelerados, donde la digitalización ha llevado a la creación, recopilación y uso de datos a una escala sin precedentes. Si bien esta revolución tecnológica nos ha brindado innumerables beneficios, también ha planteado grandes desafíos en lo que respecta a la protección en materia de privacidad y la seguridad de los datos personales. En ese contexto, la 45 quinta Asamblea Global de la Privacidad tiene el objetivo de intercambiar reflexiones y perspectivas 
pero también construir e identificar soluciones para esos desafíos que entraña la privacidad y la protección de datos personales para que ésta se preserve. Tal que está en constante evolución. Es importante señalar que el tema central de esta asamblea adquiere una importancia crucial en el contexto actual. La privacidad no es un concepto abstracto, sino un derecho fundamental que todas y todos los sectores estamos llamados. Durante los próximos días, exploraremos aspectos clave como la regulación de la privacidad a nivel global, la ética en la recopilación y tratamiento de datos personales, y al mismo tiempo podremos analizar los últimos avances tecnológicos y tendencias hacia la seguridad, la inteligencia artificial y otros asuntos relacionados con la privacidad y protección de datos en el entorno digital. Lo anterior, en virtud de que los desafíos que enfrentamos trascienden las barreras nacionales y la cooperación internacional, resulta esencial para que podamos atenderlos de manera eficiente y eficaz. En ese sentido, esta Asamblea en esta sesión abierta que iniciamos, representa una oportunidad invaluable para avanzar hacia discusiones y acuerdos más sólidos en el ámbito de la protección de datos personales. Mientras que en la sesión cerrada, contaremos con un espacio propicio para el debate y la colaboración, lo cual nos permitirá fortalecer tanto la capacidad de nuestra Asamblea en su conjunto como nuestra actuación a nivel nacional como autoridades. De esta manera, es imperativo que continuemos construyendo en unidad fortalezas, acciones y estrategias basándonos en las lecciones aprendidas a lo largo de más de 40 años de historia de la Asamblea Global de la Privacidad. Una de las características distintivas de esta es la adopción de resoluciones que abordan principios, deberes y buenas prácticas en el tratamiento de datos. En esta ocasión, nuestro enfoque estará basado en plantear cuestiones vanguardistas que protejan la esfera individual y al mismo tiempo propongan enfoques éticos y responsables para la gobernanza de datos en la era digital. Por ello, nuevamente reitero y deseo que en este espacio no solamente sea un lugar de reflexión y de discusión, sino también un punto de partida para la acción, para la construcción de una agenda conjunta. Al final de nuestras deliberaciones, aspiramos a generar recomendaciones y directrices concretas que contribuyan al avance en la protección de la privacidad a nivel global. Después de haber explorado y discutido de manera profunda en nuestros grupos de trabajo y en el seno de esta asamblea, vislumbramos un futuro alentador en lo que se refiere a la mejora de la producción, utilización y aprovechamiento de los datos en los próximos tiempos. En ese contexto, quiero reconocer una vez más que somos una comunidad que trabaja y colabora de manera constante. Desde aquellos primeros pioneros en 1979 hasta hoy, hemos visto crecer nuestra membresía, reuniendo a más de 130 instituciones de todo el mundo. Me llena de entusiasmo que estemos aquí, representando al INAI, la comisionada Román y una servidora, y su presencia y compromiso son un testimonio de que el multilaterismo, la capacidad de integración y el espíritu de cooperación siguen floreciendo a nivel mundial. Es alentador saber que estos valores son fundamentales y seguirán siendo la base para fomentar democracias más sólidas y saludables. 
Finalmente, en nombre de todos los involucrados en esta organización, queremos agradecerles su presencia y especialmente a nuestros queridos anfitriones que nos reciben aquí con los brazos abiertos. Muchas gracias por su presencia y que sea un éxito esta asamblea. Muy buenas tardes. Thank you very much, Commissioner Ibarra. Uh, next, I am pleased to welcome Her Excellency the Governor, Ms. Rina Lalji, who has been kind enough to join us this evening and to provide a welcome to this assembly. Uh, governor Lalji was appointed as Governor of Bermuda in December 2020, and before that, Her Excellency was Director at His Majesty's Treasury, where she was responsible for implementing and enforcing financial sanctions and served in various government departments. So please join me in welcoming Her Excellency the Governor. Good evening, everyone, and welcome from me as well to the 45th meeting of the Global Privacy Assembly. I'm delighted that we've been able to host you here in Bermuda, and I want to extend my thanks to Commissioner White and his entire team for making it possible for you all to be here. I'd also like to thank you all for making the journey because I more than most know that you must have met with some cynicism at home and in the office um, as, as people believed that you were just coming here because of the beautiful beaches, to understand the, the depth of history that exists here in Bermuda, visit a UNESCO heritage site or, or so, but actually nobody will have believed that you were really going to sit in a room and talk about privacy for, uh, for this time. And so I thank you for, um, for withstanding the pressure that you will have come under and making the journey nevertheless. As the quantity and variety and sensitivity of the data required to power our economies, our governments, businesses and communities grows at what seems like an exponential rate, so does the importance of controlling how that information is used, stored, shared, and protected. Simultaneously, the public worries more about privacy, identity theft, and the use of big data to drive the fast developing AI systems means that there is an increasing political pressure for the delivery of effective frameworks to protect our freedoms without constraining our economic development. That balancing act is hard wherever in the world you are. Whether you're in a large jurisdiction or a small one, that is a difficult thing to do and always, I am sure, feels like you have not got the resources that you need to be able to do it. And so I hope that through the course of this assembly, this will be a really important opportunity to discuss some of the common challenges that you, you are facing and also to develop some of that capability. As a public servant myself who has operated within the legislations here in Bermuda, in the UK and with the European requirements as well, I suppose I've been at the other end of the system from the information and privacy commissioners gathered here today and I've done that for the last 20 years or so and so I think it's fair to say that sometimes the challenges of compliance with the various legislation and frameworks has provoked some frustration amongst my, my colleagues, and particularly as those frameworks have become more robust and more impactful. The volume of the requests, the pressure to get the decisions right, and the consequences of non-compliance have really put the, the time, have required us to put the time and energy and attention into this area. But whilst I may have occasionally shared in the frustration of my colleagues, I've also developed a great respect for the discipline that well-implemented frameworks can impose on the powerful, sort of the importance of protecting the rights of the people that we serve. And I believe in the importance of these safeguards to the transparent and accountable operation of a modern, tech-enabled and data-rich society. In my current role, I also have the responsibility of 
ensuring the operational independence of those who hold those offices. Here in Bermuda, we've had just over a decade to adjust to the requirements of the Public Access to Information Act. And as we're preparing to really make another step change in the implementation of the Personal Information Protection Act as they, it becomes fully into force next year, that adjustment will undoubtedly bring challenges for many. As a raft of new obligations on data processors and controllers come into effect, but the benefits I hope from this conference will be to really raise greater awareness amongst those who need to comply as well. Awareness of the rights and the obligations and to ensure that we are doing our very best to protect the public. And so it is with genuine hope and expectation that I wish you all a very successful assembly. Thank you. Thank you very much to Her Excellency. Uh, we are grateful for your support here tonight, uh, as in many other ways on many other days. So thank you very much. Uh, next, I am pleased to welcome Dr. Charlotte Andrews, the Head of Cultural Heritage at the Bermuda National Trust, to provide keynote remarks on the context of Atlantic history and the intersection of personal information, history, and heritage. Uh, so please join me in welcoming Dr. Andrews. Oh. Your Excellency, Privacy Commissioners, all distinguished delegates, Good evening. On behalf of the Bermuda National Trust, it is an honor to speak to you all at the 2023 Global Privacy Assembly. I would like to thank Bermuda's Privacy Commissioner, Alexander White, for inviting me to open this important week of exchange for the international privacy sector. I hope to help give you a warm welcome to Bermuda and to stir some ripples in your minds as you head into engaging sessions and side events organized by the Program Advisory Committee on the changing waves and fast-flowing currents in your sector. I'm coming at this address from the heritage field, stirring world heritage, maritime heritage, digital heritage, and anti-racist heritage in. I hope to provide a different but relevant angle to the data protection issues of your field. Your privacy work is clearly incredibly important, and we are aligned in having a very real and urgent sense of purpose that demands innovative and proactive strategies. The Trust's mission to protect and promote Bermuda's natural and cultural heritage for everyone forever spans heritage stewardship, management, and advocacy, and education. We care for over 280 acres and over 80 properties across Bermuda, from historic houses, gardens, and cemeteries, including a large proportion of them in our World Heritage Site, to nature reserves and farmland on the mainland, islands, and coastline. Our scope isn't limited to sites with which we are entrusted. However, we act as an independent heritage watchdog representing the concerns of our members and the wider community campaigning when we see development with negative impacts or other problematic uses of heritage from best practice or sustainability standpoints. We also provide learning experiences for the stewards of the future, giving Bermuda's youth the seeds of understanding about their island home to grow their own activism. And heritage research of all kinds not only expands our understanding of Bermuda, but but helps us to critically reflect on the, the ch and challenge the status quo of our practice. Delivering on our mission for everyone forever is challenging though, when Bermuda's heritage reflects the inequities of the past, wasn't built to last, and faces so many threats. 
a statement that could also be made about many modern information management systems, as I understand from Alex. So whether you are here on the island or a digital de delegate, we invite you to explore and support the heritage that the trust and fellow local cultural partners champion across our 21 mile lush limestone stretch standing alone here in the mid-Atlantic. At once geographically isolated and culturally connected, Bermuda has uniquely evolved, but has also been shaped by external forces for five centuries. Waves of people have arrived accidentally, been forcibly brought, or have come by choice to our shores. Bermuda's National Cultural Heritage Policy captures our cult cultural tapestry in saying, quote, the, plural the plurality of our society is one of its greatest strengths. Our identity as Bermudians is connected to the wider world through the roots of European explorers, enslaved people of African and Amerindian descent, mainland Portuguese and Azorean peoples, political and trade connections with British and American interests, and familial and historical connections with British, excuse me, with the Caribbean. This identity continues to change and develop as a result of more recent arrivals of people from the Philippines and other Asian countries. As you explore the island, you too will become part of our heritage, interpreting this place and people through your own lens and transforming it through your interaction. Although certainly not our only heritage site, our World Heritage Site is our highest heritage designation. The historic town of St. George and related fortifications spanning much of the East End is a 400-year-old continuously inhabited living town and cultural tourism experience that you really shouldn't miss. Like every one of the 1,200 UNESCO sites around the globe, our status is based on the site's outstanding universal value to humanity. Your 100-country privacy assembly represents about half the signatories to the World Heritage Convention, and no doubt many more World Heritage sites inscribed within your respective borders. As a British overseas territory, the government of Bermuda reports to the UK government a state party to the World Heritage Convention. Yet Bermuda is largely responsible for managing the site and maintaining our UNESCO status. As the host community, we also have the most to gain, gain from the site and its exceptional significance. Beyond government's role, the Trust is one of many public and nonprofit cultural and tourism partners working for the World Heritage Site, along with East End stakeholders. In St. George's, you'll find some of the Trust's historic house museums, all of which were sites of enslavement. In these authentic and potentially triggering spaces, we are reimagining how we tell the stories about the past using the built and archeological heritage and our collections of antique furniture, artwork, and artifacts owned and made by Bermudians. The trust museums and other sites of stewardship and storytelling in the East End are but a fraction of Bermuda's world heritage experience. Yet they are part of the important opportunities we have to use our heritage for Bermuda's benefit. The way Bermuda's heritage spans sublocal local and global scales appears to parallel your data protection and privacy work on local, national, and international levels. As a small island state where tourism has long been an important pillar of the economy, we Bermudians can sometimes overemphasize the tourist perspective and even identify ourselves through the tourist gaze or other external perspectives from the outside in. But rather than being a tourism-focused badge of honor that doesn't do much to address local needs, UNESCO World Heritage status is increasingly focused on community engagement and sustainability. Our UNESCO status can help us to meet UN sustainable development goals, most relevant to Bermuda and St. George's, namely reduced inequalities, sustainable cities and communities, and quality education. Those local needs and global goals are bound up with the notion of two Bermudas, which most often refers to the island's entrenched inequities stemming from the historic genocide and enslavement of people primarily of African descent and related legacies of racism. 
This gulf also plays out in the mismatch between Bermuda's global and local realms, where the corporate entities that contribute so much to our local economy may have a wholly different experience to more disadvantaged Bermudians and guest workers. This disparity is also reflected in nonprofits like the Trust, who are generously supported by our corporate groups, other donors, and our members, yet remain chronically underfunded and stretched beyond capacity as we seek to fulfill our important missions. Likewise, our World Heritage Site needs both funding and capacity. UNESCO provides no funding, which really can't be expected with so many inscribed sites and so many under extreme threat. Despite being a UK overseas territory, our site does not have the funding, professional heritage teams, and management infrastructure we see at many UK World Heritage sites. In this disparity, Bermuda has synergy with fellow small island states and places less able to compete on the playing field, whether it be for heritage or privacy. Certainly in heritage, there can be huge discrepancies between jurisdictions. So it's great to see the Caribbean region and indigenous perspectives foregrounded in this week's program. In my 25 years in heritage and museums, I've mainly focused on my own community here in Bermuda. You would think that it was the opportunities I've had to study and consult overseas that grew my thinking most. But it was doing research here at home and applying what I learned to my daily work that has taught me the most about what heritage is and understanding which ought to be the bedrock of the heritage field, yet is often lacking or replaced with presumptions about the very thing that, that underpins all our work. What is heritage? This was the question driving my research. Is it old buildings or artifacts displayed in museums? Is it family heirrooms or oral traditions passed from generation to generation? Or is it also something much less tangible and central to people's lives? To answer this, I positioned myself outside the heritage institutions and more mainstream ideas about heritage, and instead explored more grassroots, community uses of heritage. I also needed an angle from which to explore heritage, like Bermuda sloops made from the Bermuda cedar tree and skilled Bermudian pilots who have long navigated through our reef system and into our harbors, the sea became my way in. Maritime heritage gave me access to Bermudians and their uses of heritage that I might not have encountered as a white female Bermudian. Contrary to notions that heritage is a place, a thing, or the past itself, my research supported the idea that heritage is a living process. My findings showed how contemporary Bermudians use their relationships with the sea to formulate their identity and their sense of community. These community uses of heritage proved to be about past maritimes, but also about remembering and forgetting Bermuda's enslavement and how to reckon with its lasting legacies of inequity about curating collections and knowledge in quite different ways from museums and heritage institutions, and about providing remedies to local social needs, particularly for young Bermudians at risk. We may look back or ahead, but we are always using and generating heritage in the present. That said, we all now need to be much more futurist to anticipate the threats, challenges, and opportunities coming up. This means not only focusing on negative impacts, but on proactively mitigating harm. It is in such work that we may still redress the climate crisis, international conflict, and social inequity as the greatest interrelated threats of our time. Although I hear we may need to add AI to that list. Both optimism and focus are essential. I believe that in Bermuda and with our partners, we need to prioritize building a holistic digital infrastructure for heritage management and community participation. Just as bridges connect our archipelago of islands, I see great potential in leveraging the public access possibilities of IT for the heritage process to forge connections, expand our story, and the number and diversity of storytellers who tell it. 
I envisage an online portal that will unite Bermuda's wealth of cultural resources, will support work and collaboration across Bermuda's cultural sector, and which is built on community participation. Conversely, such a portal would address problems of disconnected and inaccessible cultural resources, Bermuda's cultural sector being undervalued, and the loss of community cultural connections, which is constant. Such a digital portal could bridge space and place, linking cultural attractions, sites, and trails, as well as global connections to Bermuda. It could bridge time across our island's ever-expanding timeline and family tree, with heritage uses continuously added, so we, we are always building our future archive. It could bridge tangible and intangible linkages, building an ever-growing array of cultural forms, collections, and themes and bringing together cultural partners, community members, so there is co-curation and collective ownership. But again, focus is vital, and I believe we should first focus on what should be our gold standard, our one and only World Heritage Site. Without even a website for Bermuda World Heritage at this time, we could make a quantum leap in our heritage management, interpretation, and community involvement by establishing a collective digital portal. The many aspects, or what UNESCO calls attributes of the site, could be mapped for their care, storytelling, and as catalysts for community heritage making. With such a digital dream could come potential nightmares, such as data being misused, manipulated, or even weaponized, as many of you are guarding against. How do we ensure the data collected and shared remains knowledge-based distinguishing reliable evidence and interpretation from problematic leaps? How do we allow different perspectives to sit together rather than quashing each other? How do we avoid the dangers of the single story, fixed identities, and static notions of heritage? How do we make room for counter-narratives and dissonant views? How do we protect Bermuda's cultural intellectual property and the massive past investment by tradition bearers, donors, nonprofits, and other individuals and institutions in the development of our local knowledge? How do we avoid private and commercial control of such a community owned project that could be monetized to support our nonprofits in their missions, such as for our World Heritage Site? And how do we collaborate with IT and other partners in ways that still preserve control and ownership? over our own culture and heritage? I suspect the answers lie in the thoughtful work you are all doing. I suspect such harm can be best combated by identifying and mitigating risk, and by identifying how something like heritage can benefit people and grow empathy and peace. The post-war formation of UNESCO in 1945 as an intergovernmental mechanism for building peace was extended in 1972 when the World Heritage Convention was signed. As national identities are now recrystallized, critiques of the World Heritage System are calling for a return to a focus on cultural connections and peace building. Our work is aligned in trying to find solutions that do not simply balance, but mutually respect and benefit different people's perspectives and actual needs. Whether for World Heritage or privacy, we must think both within and beyond our own personal, institutional, and national positioning towards both local benefits and global goals. By empowering our communities, we, we resist a colonial paternalism that treats only authorized heritage managers as gatekeepers who contribute to and control such a system. Our roles have shifted from cutting ribbons and celebrating our achievements to opening the gates to make space for others to create and curate their own heritage, particularly to direct descendants or wider diasporas of those who have suffered historical trauma. This opening up will expose the gaps, what has been missing. There is a necessary double standard at this time that provides more space for heritage that has long been marginalized and minimized, silenced and suppressed, erased and excluded. This opening up also provides more space for new heritage uses and cultural expressions 
This includes the voices and choices of artists and activists, including those that aren't institutionally authorized. This may upend traditional notions and overused or cliched forms of heritage, but also move us away from racist, oppressive, or static systems. Like our recent efforts at the Trust to put Bermuda's enslavement registers from the Bermuda Archives online, or to relocate the more sensitive and more sensitively interpret prominent portraits of white Bermudians so we make everyone in, our, everyone in our black majority community feel welcome, or hosting facilitated focus groups with descendants for reimagining the sites of enslavement under the, our care. There are all sorts of ways we can embed restorative justice in our work and counter the ways we reproduce inequity. Broader anti-racism work that has only just started to repair centuries of historical trauma and social inequity takes time. We must see such heritage reparations as an urgent yet ongoing process of building trust across and with our communities. As the former president of World Heritage UK, which is an independent advocacy group for the UK's World Heritage sites, including Bermuda and three in the other overseas territories, once said to me, our work is like drips in a stone, but over time we leave an impression. Your program focuses on both thoughtful strategies and measurable action. It's much the same for us at the Bermuda National Trust, where we are striving to make real steps forward and to make those steps really count. So let's all keep stirring up ripples. Let's keep swimming along or deftly defying the currents carrying our communities and world. And of course, let's keep making waves. I would like to thank my sister Meredith of Meredith Andrews Photography for use of all the Bermuda uh, images in my slideshow. And I'd like to thank ChatGPT for writing my speech. <laughs> Just joking. Uh, please visit the Trust website at bnt.bm and hope you all enjoy, enjoy Bermuda and our heritage. Thank you.